Hi guys, I'm uh, delighted to be in your company. Uh, I've been amazed by my students in the last, uh, the last two days. The progress they have made is really incredible. And uh, they give me so much energy uh, to see that talent can bloom so fast. It's, uh, it's beautiful. Uh, so a round of applause to them. Um, two days ago, I had a wonderful news that I want to share with you guys. Uh, Dirk van der Eyden, a great uh, cinematographer, has just finished his first movie on my life, on my ideas, and on my work. And uh, this is a great accomplishment that I'm happy to uh, share with you. He represented his country at the Biennale of Venice, and he did 300 movies uh, on artists, and I'm the last movie he, he made. So um, now we're going to go to the slide and we're going to speak a little bit about uh, where I come from. I come from Paris, but Paris is not just a town. It's uh, an architecture, it's a past, it's a personality, and it has educated me. Uh, so let's see, let's go in Paris for a couple of minutes. All right? So that's the Louvre. That's the Louvre. That's the Louvre I knew before the pyramid. And so when I was nine years old, uh, my parents used to bring me to the, uh, to the Louvre every Sunday. So that was absolutely beautiful because when I was a boy, nine years old, I was seeing all this painting and all this sculpture. And it, they, they were speaking to me. Of course, as a boy, I wanted to sleep in a sarcophagus and stay inside the Louvre for the night. Uh, but <laughs> I didn't do that. But I just being like a sponge and seeing all these great masterpieces from the 19th century. And they became, they became me, and he created the necessity for me to do the same thing. So that was the Louvre, and I was lucky enough when I was 13 to see the transformation. You know, it's fascinating when you can see a city change and your own life risen. Then there was this painting, the biggest painting in the Louvre, that influenced me considerably. So you see the guy here, you see the size, it's enormous. Actually, it's uh, the raft of the Medusa of Jericho. It's a beautiful painting. Look at the knowledge of the anatomy. Look at the light. Look at all the, the figure, how beautifully drawn they are. So I saw that with my young eyes, and I marveled at it. After you go across the river, and you have another museum that opened later when I was 17. I was lucky enough to be there the day it opened. And inside, you have an enormous painting here, which is the decadence of the Roman Empire by Thomas Couture, one of the greatest teachers of the 19th century. Same thing. Look at the figure. Absolutely gorgeous definition of the muscles. Look at this face in light with the other part in shadow. Look at the statue. This is a beautiful painting. Uh, that I was lucky enough to see when it freshly arrived. One day, I arrived to the Orsay Museum, who does uh, also temporary exhibit, and then I turn on a corner, and I was not prepared for that. I see this. Okay, this is pure madness. This is a ballet between heaven and earth. Uh, for the dancer here, look at that. They're dancing, but they never go back on the ground. That sounds interesting idea. So when I saw that, I was really, uh, really shocked by the beauty of this piece. It's by Jacek Malwiski, a Polish artist from the 19th century. That's the Rodin Museum. So who does beautiful statue, the greatest sculptor of the end of the 19th century. He wrote a testament for artists, which might be interesting for all of you. He said, technique is important, craft is important but be a man before being an artist. And he meant by that, have something to say about life. And then your art will be interesting because it's not pure technique. It's about existence. It's about who we are. It's about the essence of man. That's what art is so fascinating. If it was just a craft, it would be uh, limited. It has a philosophical dimension. Like this Adam, for example. Of course, it's him. You maybe know him more by this statue. So that's an enormous door. Um, it goes higher than the screen here, all in bronze. I was lucky enough to create uh, my own door as well, and uh, in the foundry that has the sample of this door. Uh, so it was fascinating. 
uh, to see that when you love something, uh, adore, and passionate about a craft, art comes back to you. So this bridge also full of figures, the bridge Alexander the uh, Third. This is the Opera House, um, full of statues. The collaboration between sculptor and architecture doesn't exist anymore, barely. Uh, the human figure, for some reason, has gone out of the landscape. But all these are human figures everywhere. My foundry put the golden statue on top of this roof with cables. I don't know if you pictured. <laughs> That's inside. I mean, I love minimalism, but come on. Uh, I don't know. Something pretty about that, no? I went to a private party here. It's, it's wonderful. The director of the dance is actually Benjamin Milpied. For a dancer, his name is uh, Benjamin Thousand Feet. That is extraordinary for a dancer, having a name like that. And he's married to an American woman, an actress called Natalie Portman. <laughs> Staircase, Musée Gustave Moreau, splendid. The only museum in the world where you can see 2,000 drawings and hold them in your hand. Because usually they're in the basement so the light of the sun doesn't destroy them. Private house, private museum. It's beautiful when you live somewhere, you create, and one day people can walk in the corridors where you thought you imagined another world. But there is one problem, though. This 19th century was full of figures, but you couldn't find education. Because of the entire Duchamp and Warhol thing, people stopped learning. They said, oh, but the figure is the thing of the past. You don't draw, you don't represent anymore. It's passé. Uh, but I didn't believe it. And I was probably the only one in Paris at the time to say no to that. I said, OK, interesting. But looking at a can of bean for hours, or a new rhino, no, I don't believe it. OK? So let's go. Let's not contradict the past and the future. Um, humanity self-developed itself beyond what we, what we understand. So we can use the old techniques in the past to express contemporary sentiments and contemporary ideas. It's not antagonist. So I had to leave Paris because there was not one single drawing instructor or painter who was able to, in Paris, no one. And I knew a lot of people. So I've heard, I made some research, and I heard that in Florence, Italy, there was a, a little group of people working with 19th century technique. So I moved out of Paris, and I moved to Florence. Uh, I did a piece, a sculpture called Seeking for Art Lost. I've been seeking for 20 years, taking all the pieces of the, of the knowledge together so that I could express the art that I want. So I went to Florence, and they were all studying Barg. You're going to be surprised, but that's the education of Picasso. That's the education of Lautrec. That's the education of uh, many people. Uh, that were very famous in the 20th century. And the problem, the art and the drawing become really weak because people started where they ended. But the source was construction and technique. That's why Lautrec's figure in this cabaret, in the Moulin Rouge, they are very, there's a lot of movement, but there's a lot of structure. And that's why we can look at them. Basically, taking read of that, it's like for... Um, there's a lot of musicians here. For a musician saying, you're playing the piano? Come on, why? You know, piano is a thing of the 19th century. Why do you do that? Actually, we don't know anymore how the piano works. Did you blow in it? Does that work? Uh, <coughs> so we don't know today how to sharpen a pencil either. Okay? The pencil is my piano. When Wagner is, uh, is preparing a composition, he plays it in the piano first before the big orchestra, okay? When Michelangelo did the Chapelle 16, he used a pencil to map out these bodies, and then he did the ceiling. That's my version of it. So all these half-tones, this nebula of half-tone, all this uh, going towards the light, these, these are techniques that are from this time. 
So looking at all these figures, I started drawing the figures for, in Florence, eight hours a day. And doing, we're going to go through these, these figures because there's so many uh, quite fast. But all what we call in academy, which is uh, basically a study of the human body. In the 80s, people were saying, oh, are you figurative or are you abstract? There's nothing more abstract than the human body. It's full of cones, of planes, of lights, of uh, different geometrical faces and planes. So I did a lot of these figures. I still do. A lot of exercise to know where's the shadow, where's the focal light, to just own my craft. Some of these drawings are made uh, through four weeks. So one pose, four weeks, about 60 hours. And trying to find this definition that they had so beautifully done in the 19th century. Once I was able to draw and to understand my craft, I went back to the Louvre where I was going as a child, and I say, do you mind if I copy this piece here uh, of Ribera, the deposition of the Christ? So they were, they were very graceful, and they, they said yes. And uh, so I started to do a copy exactly the same size. Actually, they were worried that I was going to replace it at night because uh, <laughs> I'm copying an $8 million uh, pieces here. I was actually really, when I was doing the, the medium and going like that, I was afraid that the, the, you know, the, the liquid will go in the... Because I, not, less because of the lawsuit than my adoration for this man. Uh, the lawsuit is uh, secondary. So this is a painting I spent three months in the Louvre doing only that every day. You know, think about art as a religion. Dedication, patience. Don't, don't hesitate to really use an enormous amount of time doing only one thing. It, it will teach you something. That's the, the original and the copy. That's for my student here. That's what you guys are doing. Underpainting. <laughs> okay? The preparation, like Leonardo da Vinci used to do. Okay? Underpainting. No color. Okay? Or umber. And then at the end, that was really ironic. The Louvre asked me the authorization to show my painting to the curators. And I was like, are you asking me the authorization? Me, you know, it's like, of course, yeah, granted. So uh, Tuesday, when the Louvre is closed, they, they show the painting to all the curators of all the departments. Uh, I, I think they, they didn't want the painting to leave for some reason. Uh, that's a funny picture of me. It's my glasses and a little French flag above my head. It's a, I, you know. So that's, that's, that's my palette, okay? I was putting all the flesh tone of the Christ. You're going to see my reflection. Just, I'm going to go like this. Tones of the Christ, okay? Flesh tone, dark to the lightest, okay? All the colors here, in order, from cold to warm. This is organization. If you love your craft, you organized about it. You like your material. A good painting or good work starts with the material. Okay, that's a figure, an academy. Have you seen my drawing? This is an academy in sculpture. Once I knew how to, to draw, to paint, uh, I could, with a model, do exactly uh, his anatomy, his figure, about this size. That is a torso life size. So this is really, this is about 50 hours of work and the model posing with all the, the similarities and, uh, and how we work that, we work that with the technique of the 19th century. The 19th century gives us a lot in drawing, in music, as you know, uh, for the musician. I don't know what happened at this time in history, but there was a lot, a lot of beauty. And uh, it's basically the technique of the four profile. When you draw, you have one profile. When you sculpt, you have this profile, and then this one, and then this one, and then this one. So you have to turn the model constantly. Okay? Things that was forgotten as well. This is uh, another torso with the, all the definition of the muscles. These are exercise. This is, this is life size. 
Okay, so now with all the exercise, we're going toward the creation. When you know every facet of your craftsmanship, um, you can go to more definition. I kept this picture because you see the construction here in metal. So it's all on welded, uh, on a welded structure um, that is calculated on the bone structure of the model, exactly millimeter by millimeter. I measure pelvic bone, spine, seven cervical, and uh, acromion bones and all the lengths of the arm. And after I start sculpting. Of course, my model doesn't levitate. Uh, but I make him levitate because I use perception, but I also use memory. So for example, if I ask a model to do this, it's got the, the arm's going to be flat. But if I ask him to extend, the muscle are going to show up. So I'm going to photograph with my memory all the tension of the body, and I'm going to translate it here. Okay. So that's in construction. I mean, not anymore, but <laughs> here the head is not here anymore. He's, uh, he's not me yet. So you see all the spine, all the elbows. And here that's the final statue. And then here I add some ribs. I'll go back to this one. OK? So I did that in, uh, in the gallery uh, Dreamer Concept which is, has a wonderful program of artists in residence and uh, where I can do monumental things. That's 300 pounds of clay, by the way. It ended up in the cover on Memorial Day of the magazine, uh, the newspaper, sorry. Okay, so now that I knew all this, uh, I went to Cara. Cara is the mountains of, of marble where you have where Michelangelo used to used to carve his marble. So I went there. This is the cave. It's really, really tall. It's taller than this ceiling. And I extracted my piece of marble and I started to work on the commission of Dante for a private collection. This is Dante, the greatest writer who ever existed in my opinion. Uh, wrote the Divine Comedy, uh, described Inferno, the Describe hell, Progatoyo, and Paradiso. This is his profile. So that's a funny thing. <laughs> I was working so much on this statue. You know, you have a piece of rock, and you have to go to find the, the detail and the beautiful skin and all that. It's really difficult, and it takes about 300 hours of work because I do all handmade. I don't use power tool or anything like that. And one day I say, okay. This is too, too much work. I need a break, so I take my car. I go randomly in the south of Italy, not knowing where I'm heading. And I arrive to a village called San Leo. Say, that's interesting. This big rock like this in the middle of nowhere. Let's stop the car. I go up here. And why do I see on every, <laughs> on every wall the portrait of Dante? <laughs> So, I was like, okay, what's going on here? Uh, I'm trying to get some rest from this, uh, you know, and I, I see your face everywhere. I love you, but come on, give me a break. I need to breathe, okay? Uh, I'm dedicated, but come on, please. Uh, give me some privacy. Um, so, I asked the people, w w why Dante is over there in Italian? Ma perché Dante su questo muri? Eh, they said to me, but sir... That's where he created and imagined the Divine Comedy. I had goosebumps. I say, okay, but a little bit uncomfortable, though. It's like, you know, I'm going to meet him in, a, in the street or something. Uh, so I say, okay, that's great. Very glad to look. It's a purgatorio because there is a road going around the mountain. So I say, okay, I get out of here. I go back to my marble. Then I go to Ravenna to give my respect to Dante and bring some flowers to his grave. Uh, it's a proper thing to do when you're doing his portrait. And I go to a B&B, &B, bed and breakfast. Really nice, that looks like a monastery. And the guy who owns it says, okay, uh, what are you doing? I say, oh, I'm just taking a break. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm putting some roses on the, on the tomb of the, the person I intellectually adore. And uh, 
You say, and, and who is that? I say, Dante. Oh, Dante. But you know <laughs> that the hotel where you are, and nobody knows that in Ravenna, is the place where he hid from the Florentines. I say, okay, uh, that's too much. Uh, <laughs> I'm not taking any break anymore. I'm just going to finish that piece because next time he's going to show up himself. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, that is my first marble. Why I want to tell you that? Because I, I arrived in the mountain of Carra and there was all these great faces, this old guy who tell me, ah, oh, Giovanotto, oh, you're the, the young one who wants to try the marble. Huh? And uh, I say, yes, sir. Uh, I never did marble, but I drew a lot. I really drew a lot. And I say, oh, yes, but you don't know the stone. So they were making fun of me. And uh, they give me a stone, and they give me the chisel. And that's why I talk about instrument. I look at the chisel, and they were flat, like brushes. Oh, I know how to use brushes. So I started carving planes, 5,000 hits a day. And then I got that. And they, they stopped laughing. So here, this is because I show you this work and, and where I come from. And this is uh, where I've been two months in the Foundation Chini. I have the incredible honor to represent sculpture at the Foundation Chini uh, through the Alpine Fellowship. Uh, I'll be in beautiful company. Just like here, I will be with uh, the great philosopher Roger Scruton, who has this show on the BBC in England called Why Beauty Matters. I think you, you get all here the title. And um, very popular show in the UK. He's a great philosopher. He's professor of philosophy in Oxford. And I will be with the director of the Guggenheim Museum and uh, Alan Lawson, who's a great painter and the founder of the, of the prize, and, uh, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a lot of people. Uh, so that will be an extraordinary privilege. Uh, I will be presenting a movie. Three artists only will be presenting a movie. Uh, me, sculpture, Alan, painting, and someone you need to know. Often we say, uh, oh, you know, today there's no Rembrandt anymore. There's no this, there's no that. If you make some research, there's a Norwegian painter called Odd Nerdrum. He's the greatest figurative painter alive. Uh, in my opinion, is the Rembrandt that we had Rembrandt in the 17th century. We have him today. He's still alive. He will represent painting, and he will show his movie uh, alongside, which is a movie about self-portrait. And uh, the movie will uh, explain his way of working. And my movie will explain the way of working self-portrait in sculpture. So, about this, I want to tell you that when you really adore your craft or your, if you have this quest for beauty, uh, don't think you're alone. I was alone in Paris, alone against an entire Society that was saying that my art, the art that I want to do, doesn't exist. What does that mean? I didn't believe it. And today, I'm leading uh, an art movement that is with thousands of followers. That's called Post-Contemporary post Art. And, uh, and I'm the founder of Post-Contemporary Sculpture. And there is a, a very big renaissance of the form of the human figure in art today, and it's just going to grow more and more. So don't believe what they say. <laughs> I apologize. I forgot the question part. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, please ask me a question <laughs> if you want. If you don't have to. Yes. It's a very good question. I will answer straightforward to you. Because uh, the human body is not about nudity. It's about the essence of man. The human body is the only way you can represent what's going on in your mind. 
most of uh, religion has a, a human body as a symbol. Like the Christ, the Buddha. Uh, and the way the position is on the human body, uh, the sitting pose of the Buddha meaning peace, the crucifixion meaning uh, redemption. Uh, it's a, a way to communicate ideas. Uh, the best, uh, and we're talking about that in, in this morning, the best way to, uh, to see it is to know that uh, the Vatican itself ordered to Michelangelo to paint 500 naked bodies on the Sistine Chapel to understand the big landscape, the big spiritual landscape. That's the only way. You can't do a landscape to represent ideas, or a teacup, or a potato, or a cucumber. Yes? I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't hear. Oh, okay, very good question. Uh, you don't, uh, how did I start uh, my movement? Uh, that was the question. Um, you don't do that at the beginning of your, you, you do a lot of things. Uh, you have a following and intellectuals with you that believe the same thing, art critic, and then it, only if you find something that the civilization is missing, uh, then you, you do a movement. You never do a movement to talk about yourself. You talk, do a movement to, to put the point or where there's something missing uh, in the global picture. And if you're right, you'll have very, a lot of followers very fast. Did I answer to your question correctly? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Yeah, uh, you know, I respect it, uh, and I think it, uh, it should, should exist, and it's interesting, and it has its own logic. It's just not my, my thing. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. Uh, my best advice to you uh, is to, uh, to find uh, any course. There's many, many courses in, in Florence, and uh, that's the, the place where the, the instruction right now happens. Uh, i tell you why quickly. Um, and this is important. It's about the disparation of knowledge. Do you guys realize that you have the, the knowledge of music, for example, and it's still there? My knowledge in my uh, art was, was lost in Paris, and I thought it was almost lost from the world. Never take for granted what you know of the heritage. It can go away. It can disappear, and you'll never find it again. Why is this still there in Florence? Because there was a great teacher in the 19th century called Louis-Léon Jérôme, who uh, was the main teacher at the Academy, Academy of Fine Art in Paris. He had an Italian student called Philadelphia Simi. Philadelphia Simi trained with him in the 19th century. He came back to Florence. He had a daughter, La Signora Simi. La Signora Simi, at 90 years old, gathered a group of students in Florence in the 80s and communicated the knowledge to a group of artists who now has founded all this school. So without La Signora Simi, the knowledge would, have, would not be there. So right now, Florence, or some, some school in New York as well. Uh, some of the success of this great school in Florence have moved to New York and they opened school there. So, yeah. Did, did I respond to your question? Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think that uh, in, it's more about sensibility, sensitivity. I think nature is a beautiful work of art. So if you, you can be in a farm and, and see beauty. Uh, but my, page, my passion for sculpture, maybe I wouldn't have not had it. Yeah. Okay? Yes? Uh, the form, the form, you know, uh, Sculpture, drawing, is about light and shadow. It's about the sun. It's about how the sun hits an object, how the sun hits 
uh, a person and then create an angle with a shadow and light, a beautiful form along. There's no difference between a man and a tree. Oh, second question. Uh, That's a great question. Uh, I, I'll be honest with you, I think not. I don't. Which doesn't mean that beauty is not uh, included in the future, but I said no. Okay, yes? Thank you. He, he did quite a lot to speak to me. <laughs> I, I, I don't want him to speak to me anymore. I mean, not that way. No, no. He freaks me out. But I love him. I'm sorry? No, I understand. I understand your question. I'm just, uh, I'm just still in the trauma of this experience. Uh, um, yeah, how does he speak to me? Because... Uh, Bo, uh, with his question, was talking about the human condition. And I think that he gave a great picture of life and, and the human condition and uh, how we go through life, uh, what is our relation between life and, life and the afterlife. He went even so far to describe the afterlife, which is completely insane. Uh, but he did it, and I think that that is extraordinary to me. You know, I like an art that is not only focused on, on what exists. I like to know... Uh, do what, what we believe or what we imagine. Is that true or is that a man's invention? That's a huge question, and he tackled it. Yes? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, first, yes, first. Um, when you first started out in Paris, what happened going when so many people turned you away or rejected your artwork from what you were Oh, I apologize. Can you rephrase it, please? I'm sorry, I'm French. I'm No, I, it's, not, it's really, I, I, sorry, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay, sorry. What kept me going when there was no everywhere? Okay. You know, it's just, I'll give you a bit of an image because it's difficult to, to get just, uh, I'll give you a metaphor. Uh, when I was a teenager, when I was your age, uh, and I had a bad week, and I didn't understand the world, and I didn't understand people, I didn't understand the reaction, I didn't understand, I thought there was something chaotic about life that was not simple. Um, the Saturday night, instead of going in the nightclub or I don't know what, I was taking the subway, and I was escalating the fence of the Roda Museum, and behind the, the bar, I was looking at the statue sleeping under the moonlight, and that would give me a sense of peace. So, to answer your question, it's the sense of peace that I'm looking for uh, through this beautiful art. And that's why I keep on going for it, because uh, it, beauty gives you peace. Yes? Do I have a pose that I feel I connected more than others? Um, I connected to all of them because they, you know, your life is temporal. Your life uh, moves. Your ideas, your existence, you're not the same all the time. So each time I find something, it was true at this moment of my life. When I did this big piece that was shown in, the, in New York in the uh, Art, National Art Club, uh, when I won the selection over there, it was a piece that at the time meant uh, how I felt, you know. And uh, the piece that, I, that you saw over there with the arm extended and the knee up, it's how I'm feeling right now. So it's temporal, uh, like the cells. Okay? So I identify to all of them. <laughs> yes? There's this very good question. Thank you. There's this big idea that you've heard probably in the 20th century that nobody was ever trained. 
uh, I saw you what Picasso was going through. Picasso went through the same education that you guys are doing right now. Uh, uh, so a lot of people, because it went probably very fast. And I thought that when I was a teenager. People say, oh, you're an artist, so you don't need to be trained. I tell you, this is a lie. You know, you need a lot of training. Even if you go way off uh, what we're doing here, it doesn't matter. You need structure. So know your craft and, and deal with a couple of masters in their craft. Yep. All right. Oh, sure. The back. And a very good question. Uh, the back. And you know why? Because a lot of people like to do portraits. Uh, but, you know, I, don't, I do portraits, of course, but I don't like to do portraits in, in a way because we all have an idea of ourselves and we, we project an idea and we want people to see us in a certain way, so we do a certain haircut, a certain this and that. Uh, so the portrait is a bit, uh, the Italian say truccato, it's a uh, make-up. Uh, we don't say the truth. Uh, on the back, the shoulder, the vertebra, uh, the muscle here show exactly who you are, because you're not talking to people like that, right? So that's really what, what describes you the most. So that's why I love to, to draw the back. Oh, yeah. Yes, it's just the experience of life. Uh, life is not simple and, and it's not a straight line. So I think uh, chaos is something that we all share. And I think uh, sculpture or any art will translate every sort of state that you go through, including this one, but also happy ones and, and also beautiful ones and ecstatic ones. And so they all translate, all emotion translate into art. Um, oh, that would be the last question because I don't want to take too much time on the, on the next performance. Yes? The steps. Um, you know, for me, I, I never really thought like that. And maybe uh, as a professional, I should tell you, yes, there is step, there is a plan. Uh, let's make a plan. Uh, <laughs> I, I just wanted an idea. First, I was, I, I try to be honest, to the point that I say, if I have nothing to say in my art, I will stop being an artist. It's not about the ego. Uh, so, if I have nothing to say tomorrow in my art, I will stop, and I'm serious. I don't know, I will do a trampoline or, uh, you know, uh, anything else, it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, it's very important that you keep doing it if you, if you really uh, include the possibility in your life that you can reveal something to yourself and others. Because that's the only subject of art. Is, and that's what's new. If you understand the riddle of your century and you solve, you decipher something and discover something, then it translates into beautiful music. Listen to the piano of Eric Satie uh, at the end of the 19th century. It's a beautiful uh, revelation that he goes through life. So I would like to thank you all of you. And, uh, <laughs> thank you.